James Scott here once again, um, interviewing, you might recognise this guy's face, he's the Sky Crime Correspondent, Martin Brunt. Um, out there, where are you exactly, Martin? I'm in West Sussex, I'm on a day off, uh, but always keen to talk to people like you, Ken. <laughs> about your new book. Indeed. Well, anything you want to talk about, but the okay. book's, I guess, the main <laughs> focus. Well, listen, I've read the book over the weekend, so I am going to talk about it. I am one of the few interviewers that reads the books, you know. I love watching these interviewers that come on and they sort of say, and tell me about your book. Read the <laughs> book and then you can ask the relevant questions. So I've got yes. a, a hell of a, lots and lots of relevant questions for you, Martin, who you describe as a sleazy, dirt-digging scumbag who would sell out his own grandmother. No, that wasn't. <laughs> that's in your book. And I think it was, I, I can't remember who that was that said that. But the one thing that comes over in the book, um, Martin, is, yeah. is the struggle that, that the general hacks have, if we can call you hacks. I know you're a, a Sky reporter oh. these days, but you very much started uh, on the bottom rung of the ladder, the tour in the pubs and uh, various um, Fleet Street haunts and things um, yep. and cut your teeth there, didn't you? I did. And I, Ken, I don't mind the word hack. I mean, we're, we're all hacks and uh, I don't really see much difference between a TV reporter and a newspaper reporter. In fact, I think anybody in TV is better if they've had um, a background in newspapers, but you know, the, the world has changed and, uh, I work with an awful lot of people who come straight from a media studies course at university. Uh, and I often find that they really do miss the grounding that people like me had all those years ago in Fleet Street. So, yeah, I, um, I actually started on a magazine called Power Laundry and Cleaning News mm -hmm. uh, way, way back until I decided that that wasn't for me. I wanted to get into newspapers, so I went back and started an apprenticeship as we used to do in those days on the local paper, and then gradually, you know, worked my way up to Fleet Street and the Sunday Mirror. But you were even before that, because you used to be a paper boy, didn't you? <laughs> yes, and I, I say in the book that I think something about doing that job kind of gave me the taste mm -hmm. and the interest to be a, a newspaper journalist. It might have been conscious, it might have been subconscious, but the smell and the feel of those warm newspapers coming off the train from London into my little town in Cambridgeshire, uh, and then reading those astonishing stories from that world outside my little uh, place um, instilled in me a desire, I think, to get involved and to, to, to explore that world one day and take, uh, take a role in telling those same stories. Yeah, and, and the book... The book reads, uh, it's a, I don't think I've read a book like it, Martin, um, in that there's a lot of nostalgia in there. Um, mm -hmm. There's you're definitely from the old school network. Um, there's, there's a wee bit of, you don't actually say it as much, but reading between the lines, you're not so happy with the way things are going. Obviously, the newspapers are declining. Uh, the political yeah. correctness these days, the... I suppose the criticism that, that the police give you guys in many respects, that's a very nice relationship that you that you explore right throughout the book. But then on top of all that, what really interests me, and I'm one of these ghouls that is fascinated by um, the House of Horrors, you know, all these sort of things. Um, mm -hmm. I'm reading more or less a, a who's who of history from the late 1980s right the way through to the present day and um it was a it was a great read i have to say i mean uh two sessions um one that lasted until three in the morning but you know as a reader as a crime fiction writer myself i never tire of reading about fred west and rose west and you know all these sort of things the Sewer Murders was horrendous. I always remember watching you, you know, from, from that particular um, place. And you you actually went to school in Sewer as well, didn't you? I did. So I, I grew up in Ely, 
in Cambridgeshire, which is where I did the paper round and, you know, first got that interest in, um, in newspapers. Uh, but the, I went to grammar school. So we had a, the 11 plus in those days. So I was lucky enough to pass the 11 plus. The grammar school for Ely was Soham. So it was a boys grammar school. It was a little bit pretentious. And I mean, for instance, we did Latin for one of our O-levels. Um, but it was, a, it was a great school. Um, and I had a, I really enjoyed being there. But of course, you know, I left it a long way behind. And then suddenly this horrendous murder of the two little girls in Soham. And uh, the killer turned out to be the caretaker, Ian Huntley, yeah. who was the caretaker at my old school. Yeah, that's now, right. You didn't see that in, in the book. Yeah. Yeah. I was no. away on holiday when the murders happened, but I and it was very frustrating to be away and watching this story unfold. But I did go back uh, subsequently. I covered the aftermath. And of course, I covered the trial of Ian Huntley at the Old Bailey. And as part of that, I was chosen to go round the school with the jury on a site visit. So that brought back incredible memories and it was all terribly spooky. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me, and I don't know the answer to this question, it's not in your book. Did you ever interview Huntley? No, I didn't. Um, as I said, I, I was away on holiday um, mm -hmm. at the time that the murders happened. And within a few days, um, he was identified and then arrested. Uh, colleagues of mine did interview him. And Jeremy Thompson, you know, one of our main presenters at the time, famously did a, a live interview with That's Huntley. Right. Yeah. Uh, and um, that was studied very closely by detectives. And apparently he was giving away signs of his guilt was, even then. Yeah. Now, you, you allude to that in the book, that um, the police are all very well to have a little bit criticised criticism now and again, but well, not so much now and again all the time. But you guys serve a valuable service and, and they, on most big murder cases, they want to hold press interviews for that very reason. Yes, I mean, they the, the police need our help, particularly on those big occasions. They need us to just to publicise their appeals to the public for help. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd like to think that uh, the prid quo pro quo would be uh, that they uh, give us some hints and some lines that will give us a story as the, the case unfolds that gives us new information to report as the day goes on. But, but their main interest is, is in keeping that story alive in the headlines if they are still looking for a suspect. Now, now, getting back to that very issue, because I think you, you and I is probably the only two people in the world with the same view of this particular situation, and that was the Madeleine McCann uh, case, mm -hmm. one that I think you said no case has intrigued you more either before or since then. And uh, and I know you tried very hard to... to well, one of the, the, the girls, one of the ladies that was trolling the McCanns ended up taking her own life. But I know even before that, you you were, I suppose, appalled is the, is the right word, at the actual abuse that this couple had um, with absolutely no evidence whatsoever. And I think you mentioned in the book, if I asked 100 people or something, that 99 of them would, would be blaming the McCanns for actually what happened. But uh, as I say, I think you and I, two of the people in the world that doesn't. And I'll tell you just a quick one, Martin, I'll tell you the very reason for that. I had a little little boy at 12 months old and a little girl, nearly two. And we went away to a hotel in the Lake District and, and went for dinner one night with a little baby listening uh, uh, service on and we found at the dining room was right at the other end of this huge hotel. Mm -hmm. And when the McCann story broke, I remember my wife saying, well, they shouldn't have left there. And I said, well, we did. We left our children. And, uh, you know, you, you never believe something like that's going to happen. It, uh, it is quite incredible. And um, I, I take my hat off to you for, for sticking up for them, for want of a better word, you know? Well, the, the McCanns themselves... Um... <laughs> Uh, recognise and have talked about their terrible guilt about leaving the children as they did. Um, and 
the one thing I suppose that um, I really was puzzled about, Jerry McCann said it was a bit like having dinner in your garden with the kids asleep upstairs in their bedroom. And it really wasn't like that. They were, you know, 80, 90 yards away. It was dark. They were drinking alcohol. They couldn't see directly the apartment where the kids were. So, you know, I, I, I rather disagree with him over that. But look, they acknowledge that they made a terrible mistake and they paid a terrible price for it. And almost everybody in Portugal I've ever met blames the McCanns mm -hmm. uh, for leaving the children on their own. And it's a bit like, you know, as Brits, and you've just given me an example, we love to have two hours away from the kids, don't we, in the evening, mm -hmm. where we can sit and relax and have a drink and have our meal. The Portuguese aren't like that. And a lot of other people in Europe, they take the kids with them to restaurants. Spanish as well. Sp I mean, I live in Spain, Martin, and, and that's exactly the same. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah, absolutely, 100%, right? Um it, it, it's a very it's, British thing, isn't yeah, it? It's, it's the culture, yeah. really. That, that everybody you know, else puts puts up with the kids running around causing mayhem in the restaurant. We, I think, almost exclusively British people want our hour or two hours kids mm -hmm. free in the evening, and mm -hmm. um, you know that explains that the, the way they were um, carrying out their um, their evening mm -hmm. activities. And the one thing, and again, getting back to the press, the one thing that you can honestly say that they did do right was they kept that story alive for years and years and years, and yet they still got abuse for that. And uh, you can understand exactly why why they wanted to keep her in the in the public awareness because as soon as as soon as the awareness goes, then people stop thinking stop looking stop you know it's um it's the great joseph heller's catch 22 you can't do right for doing wrong can you no and they were advised at the start that publicity wasn't the road to go down mm -hmm. they didn't um the, the the police advisors british police advisors i think to a degree uh were suggesting that look let us work behind the scenes um, if you go with big publicity, somebody who's taken her might panic and kill her if she's still being held. And there was all that to consider, but almost from day one, the McCanns decided that publicity was the right thing to do. Yeah, such a shame. Million dollar question, do you think she's still alive, Martin? No. 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 I, I, I don't know. I mean, one of the, the intriguing things about the Madeleine McCann case is that there is no evidence of anything that I've ever seen, nothing at all to explain how she got out of that apartment. Mm -hmm. Now, the German prosecutor who has this suspect in Germany, yeah, yeah. he says he's convinced that she's dead and that this guy, Christian B, was responsible. I don't know what evidence the prosecutor has got. If it was that good, you would have thought he'd have charged Christian yeah. B by so we don't know what there is. And um, I, my gut feeling is that she must be dead. Mm -hmm. It would be extraordinary if she was still alive, being kept in some way. And, you know, she wouldn't be the first to have mm -hmm. survived this long yeah. and, um, you know, emerge alive. But I just think, um, and I think her parents kind of accept that it's just very, very unlikely that, she will be found alive. But, you know, in the absence of anything to suggest that she's dead or to show that she's dead, dead they will cling to that hope. Yeah, uh, which is only nat natural. And uh, I still think there's so many more chapters to be written written about Madeleine McCann. Uh, you, you've covered Charlie Bronson in, the, um, in your yeah. book. Well, um, there's a character and a half. I saw your postscript that said March 2023 he was up for parole and I've yeah. since read that he, he wasn't successful, unfortunately. No, uh, and I don't think any of us were really surprised, but yeah. what I think emerged from the parole hearing was an acceptance that he needs to be moved very slowly, very gradually into a less restrictive regime mm. so that they can test how he behaves when he's with other people. I mean, mm -hmm. still now, and this has been the case for many, many years, 
he hardly sees anybody. He's kept in a prison within a prison. Mm -hmm. He sees two or three jailers. Um, he rarely sees other prisoners. So nobody can really gauge how he will respond. Yeah. Can he show that he's given up his violent ways? They'll only know that when he starts mixing with more people. Yeah. So they need to, they need to lift um, the, the category in which he's kept so that you know he can show them that he can mix with other people. He's not yeah. going to start fights all the time. Yeah. But I think getting him out of prison is still going to take a long time. Yeah. I, um, I helped a guy with a, with a book uh, many years ago now. Uh, he's, I suppose you'd call him one of the London gangsters. He's a guy called Kevin Lane. I don't know if you know of Kevin Lane's I, story. I, I, I've met Kevin, yeah. Have you really? Ah, okay, yeah. that's good. Well, I, I helped him with his book, um, and ah, uh, okay. and he's um, he he met Charlie Bronson on many occasions, and Kevin yes. Aldrich said just put him on a on a island off the coast of Scotland and give him a fishing rod, and he'll never harm anybody again. You know, <laughs> um, Kevin always thought he was uh, he he was quite a guy. And uh, and you know, forty eight years in prison. But even at, at his parole hearing, he actually said, "I still like a rumble." I mean, you know, what a silly thing. Yeah. To say, you know, he. I think Charlie can be his own worst enemy. Yeah. Um, and you know, when I sat through the parole hearing, and he was effing and blinding and muttering under his breath. But I hope, and I, I think that the panel detected that. You know, he you can't expect him in a in a parole hearing like that to behave as other prisoners would. Yeah. You know, he's he's institutionalized. I mean, that's just the problem best. his biggest problem that you know he will find it incredibly difficult to do the very basic things of of living um yeah. were he to come out. I mean, I sincerely hope that he is given his freedom yeah. at some stage, but I, I I think it has to be very carefully and slowly managed orchestrated yeah it's uh, i think most of the british public uh you know even the most right wing of of, of guys that you know this must be the, as straight as a die there's there can't be many members of the public now that's that still want him to serve out the rest of his life in prison i mean give the guy a few years he's 70 now martin i think uh he is 70 yeah yeah give him a few years but uh, no, it's 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 quite incredible. And as I say, all these names in your book kind of trip off the tongue, and you you turn on the pages to think, well, who's he going to talk about next? And as I say, there's the McCanns and the Soul Murders and Fred West, and you even got a um, a, a cameraman into the House of Horrors, one of the first um, cameraman to get in the in the, uh, the House of Horrors, didn't you? I mean, that yeah. was my skin crawl as I as I read. The cameraman's report about going into the cellar and the five graves were still there all over yep. and over. I mean, he must have been messing himself. He must have been. Well, it, it's all when I went back and interviewed him for the book, um, I said, look, I'm very happy to use your name. And he said, no, I'd rather not, <laughs> which I thought was really odd, because after all this time, um, you'd thought he'd want the acknowledgement that yeah. it was him who went into the house. He tells the story you know, with his friends and people he meets and at dinner parties and so forth. Um, he regales them with, with those great details that I recount in the book. I mean, my one regret is that I was back home in West Sussex when a guy phoned up and said, look, I can get you into the house. And I'd, I'd spent all week in Gloucester. I was absolutely knackered. It was about 10 o'clock at night and I just did not have the, the, the energy to go back. So I just arranged for my cameraman to go in with this um, local guy who was just making a few quid um, yeah. and who could blame him. Um, so, yeah, they just went in the house next door that was empty, up to the roof, across the shared attic space and mm -hmm. dropped down into number 25 because the police and the forensics teams had just left and it was just waiting there for the trial many months on with a copper on the front door and who, mm -hmm. of course, had no idea that, my cameraman and his mate were um, were inside doing all that filming. Fantastic. And it, you you made me really jealous when I read that particular chapter that you said Sky would give you more or less a free reign to just go into Gloucester, 
um, frequent the pubs and clubs that the those two <laughs> animals used to frequent and yep. see what you could dig up and see who you could speak to. And uh, I just, that, that because I would have loved to have been a journalist, I would have just thought, what? What did he do? Just wandering around pubs, talking, talking to all these people. What a fantastic part of the job that must have been, Martin. Yeah, I didn't spend all my time in a pub, Ken. Um, but um, you know, the kind of characters that we were looking for did frequent mm -hmm. those kind of places. Um, there was a lot of pressure to come up with your own stories because mm -hmm. the whole world was in Gloucester. It wasn't just yeah, no. British journalists. I mean, there were camera crews from America and Japan and all parts of Europe. Mm -hmm. So we were under a lot of pressure. But I think the good thing was that my employee employers recognised that this was such a big story mm -hmm. and thankfully gave me the time to explore it properly. I came up with stories every week but just met the most astonishing characters who had known Fred and Rose West. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, I read the book. I think it was a journalist that, that wrote the book, The House of Horrors, many, many years ago. And, and again, that was a page turner. You know, they did what with their own daughter? It was just, I mean, monster is a, a term that's, that's thrown around probably a little bit too often. But those mm. two really were depraved, absolutely depraved and um you know but again we're drawn to these stories as you say so as you you so eloquently put in the book it's we're drawn to the the ghoulish nature of it the horror of it we we'll want to read more and it's just um it's just incredible that we, that we have got this thirst for this this sort of thing you know yeah i mean i'm grateful that people do have that fascination with true crime because it's kept me in a job um, for all these years. I think there are lots of reasons for it, to explain it. But I think, um, I mean, for example, uh, Fred and Rose West, um, their, most of their victims were young women who were hitchhiking around as women, young women did, you know, yeah, late 20s, yeah. in, in 1970. You know, nobody worried about women young women hitchhiking all over britain and at that time my own sister used to hitchhike from home exactly. to university about you know more than 100 miles hitching lifts with lorry drivers up the a1 mm -hmm. um, and me and my parents didn't bat an eyelid about it but you know people like my sister in those days were the victims of fred and rose so i think part of the fascination with crime is that we project ourselves or our loved ones into those situations and just think very grateful that it didn't happen to us and mm -hmm. not glad, but grateful that it happened to somebody else and, and mm -hmm. not us. And, you know, it's, there are lots of examples, but Madeleine McCann, you know, she vanished in a scenario familiar to most of us, you know, millions of people take those package holidays to Portugal and Spain and go out to dinner and, you know, the kids are there sleeping while they're doing that. And we can all imagine us in mm -hmm. that same situation and just grateful that we all came home. Yeah, I know. It's a fact. And and you said that in the book as well. And and obviously there was one of the, the girls that, that the raped very early on and she went to the police and one of the policemen, and I think you tracked them down, gave her a real hard time. And in the end, I think they got off with a hundred quid fine for for GBH or, or assault or something. Uh, yep. Where really, if he treated her a little bit more sympathetically, then really they should have both been on rape charges, and that none of it may have happened. So that that was another bit of the story, which was a was a wow jaw dropping moment, you know. And you cover it well, and as I say, you even tracked that policeman down. Yes, um, I couldn't persuade him to do an interview on camera, um, but he did more or less accept that if he hadn't given that rape victim a hard time when she came to the police and he interviewed her, he effectively questioned her about her own morals, mm -hmm. so yeah. much so that he got so upset that she decided that she wasn't going to be a prosecution witness mm -hmm. against Fred and Rose, so they didn't stand trial for rape they got off with a very minor charge and didn't go to prison. Mm. And, and it's, a, it's a moot point that, you know, if this copper 
had been much more pleasant and understanding to uh, Caroline, the uh, the original yeah, rape victim. Right. Then there could have been a prosecution. Fred and Rose would have gone to prison and they would have uh, realised that they'd had to stop that kind of behaviour. What happened was they got away with it and then they decided, well, if we're going to do this again, we can't risk leaving our victim alive, so mm -hmm. we're going to have to kill them. And then from there flowed that series of murders. I think another nine after that, if I remember right. Uh, yeah. Incredible stuff. Now, Martin, this, this interview has just come. There's about six minutes left of this block, but again, I'm more okay. than happy to, to do another interview at another time because I still feel I've got so much to ask you. But one thing I did really want to ask you was, um, tell me there's a thriller, a fiction thriller in your head somewhere. <laughs> um, no, there isn't at the moment. Um, I'd love to do it. I mean, I, I found uh, doing the book an interesting project. I, I enjoyed most of it. Um, I had very tight deadlines, so there were some very fraught moments. You've been through it more than I have. Um, it's a bit of a cliche that every journalist has a book in him. Mm -hmm. um, my feeling at the moment is that I've done my one book. Really? Um, that surprises yeah, me. I, I think so, but I do have lots and lots of stories. And um, I, I just think it's a big difference writing a true crime book. Um, compared with writing a fiction book. I mean, I've never written any fiction. I have got ideas. I know lots of cops. Um, I'd love to. I'd love to come up with a plot that um, you know that that the police um, just you know, the perfect crime. I guess we're all looking mm -hmm. to, yeah. to do. You see, the cops are turning, Martin. Yeah, turning yeah now. You've, you've probably you mentioned. It, so. You mentioned some detective that, that wrote a book together with a help from somebody. And one of the things he'd done in the book was he slagged the, the press off again. And uh, I can't remember that detective's name, but you said it was a bloody good read. Um, and uh, you mentioned... Yeah, this, is, this, is, this is Sir Mark Rowley, who's Britain's yes. top cop. Yeah. He's the commissioner yeah. of the Metropolitan Police. Yeah. Um, so in the four years he retired, before he came back last year, uh, he wrote a, a thriller. Mm -hmm. with a journalist so two of them wrote this book together and it's brilliant it's about a plot to blow up london That's and it's right. all about the counter-terror police trying to find the suspects but what i really hated about it was mm -hmm. that journalists are so disparaged all the way through yeah. so i spoke to sir mark after i read it i said look this is a really good book great twist at the end but for me you spoiled it by being so disparaging about journalists. And he said, oh, that's just, you know, it's just fiction. Mm -hmm. And I, I took him to task because, you know, he can't blame it on his co-author, who's a journalist, mm -hmm. so he wouldn't have slagged off reporters. So yeah. it must be him. So Britain's Top Cop, I think, has a downer on reporters. And I think that's quite sad mm -hmm. if that's how he really views us. Yeah, because uh -huh. he called you the pack and... And uh, all yeah. that sort of thing, uh, uh, you know. And, and again, from a book reader's point of view, that was fascinating for me as well, you know, um, reading about what you were thinking and what you're writing. And, and as I say, you don't pull any punches. One of the great things about the book is the ongoing relationship between the police and the press that really filters right through the book. And um, you, the reader gets a real feeling for... I suppose what you've been through and, and, you know, people see your glamorous side when you're sitting in a uh, sky uh, studio or whatever, or you're, you're at some crime scene and that, and they see the glamour side of things, but nobody really sees yet how we have to dig and delve for these stories and the sources and, and the people you need to speak to, you know? Yeah, I, th I think more than anything, what I wanted this book to be, I didn't really see it as a memoir, because I'm not on the verge of retiring. I wanted it to be a book that explained what it was like to be a crime reporter mm -hmm. over the past 30 years. And the publisher said to me, you can't just do the 20 big stories that you've covered. You have to reflect on the changes there have been. And, and I think that was a really good point. And, and I think it comes out in the book. You've um, certainly that, done that. You've certainly done that. Yeah. 
yeah, the changes in policing, the changes particularly in the relationship between police officers and hacks like me, particularly since the Leveson report that essentially frowned on police officers having personal relationships with reporters. I have to say, Ken, that um, it's made uh, the job of a crime reporter much, much more difficult. difficult At yeah. my age, I can live with that because I'm not going to be doing it forever. But for anybody starting out now as a crime reporter, trying to forge relationships, personal relationships with police officers, it must be very, very difficult.